Hey everyone, um, welcome to week 11. Um, welcome back. Uh, I hope that you had a good semester break. So let's dive straight back into our course. And this week we're going to look at the development of hybrid knowledge that parallels uh, the global trade of the 17th and 18th century. So really, when we think of the museum today, it grew out of what was called the Cabinet of Curiosity. Or in German, it was also known by the term Wunderkammer or the Wonder Cabinet. Now, the term originally describes a room where objects recognized for their strange and exotic values were collected and displayed often by wealthy and political, politically powerful individuals from the 16th century onwards. These private collections serve the purpose to entertain important guests, establish social ranks, and demonstrate the erudition and cultivation of the owners. Uh, so um, the beginning of the museum really came out of this social practice when the collector, when the collector of fossils and shells and animals started opening up his home in Manchester for anyone interested in viewing the collection. This was free of charge at first, then because it became a hit. Recognizing the demand, he moved the collection to London as a commercial venture and started charging an entrance fee. And hence, you have the beginning of the private museum uh, 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 by, uh, started by this person called Sir Ashton Lever, right? Uh, so Ashton Lever collected for many years different kinds of stuff, uh, you know, uh, and, and saw that there was commercial appeal and public appeals for this, uh, all this collection. Um, over time, this grew into what we understand to be the Catholic and encyclopedic nature of the museum. So out of those private ventures that responded to the demands of a market for the exotic, uh, uh, this that became increasingly volatile and robust with the expansion of the free market economy over the 18th century, uh, this also parallels shakeups that saw the rise and falls of fortune and the beginnings of colonial expansion uh, as well as for, uh, settlements overseas, uh, not forgetting the technological innovations uh, that were really uh, industrializing uh, certain parts of Europe at the time. Uh, this enabled uh, the, 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 the accumulation of fortunes by individuals who then began to fund uh, public initiatives. So early, early efforts were concentrated around the universities and universities began amassing collections, served as a significant intellectual node within a scholarly network that extends throughout the world. And this was a world that was slowly being mapped out in the process as well. All social hierarchies were crumbling. So whether it is resulted in the collapse of the monarchy or uh, the reformation or an, into a constitutional monarchy, this resulted in many royal collections uh, becoming the nucleus collection for what would be known as a national museum in the sense that these are public institutions that represented national interests Okay, uh, so over the course of the 18th and 19th century, many collections shifted from private hands into a new kind of public ownership, and this took the form of the National Museum. Um, so while these things were, of course, happening in Europe, we often assume that nothing else happened elsewhere, where modernity, and you know, the idea was that modernity hasn't really reached our shore. Increasingly, scholars are challenging this view, recognizing that if colonial encounters was a global phenomenon, then we need to also study it from the vantages or positions of this elsewhere, right? uh, recognizing that developments were also happening elsewhere as a result. So in Southeast Asia, an early example uh, was in the figure of Georges Eberhardus Rompius. He's uh, a German uh, who established a cabinet of curiosity uh, all the way in, in remote Ambon, uh, or that's part of the Maluku Island. And from Ambon, he would begin classifying uh, uh, 
the, the various sort of animal and plant lives that he was able to collect uh, in, uh, while residing in uh, Ambon. And in the past, uh, the image on the left had singularly captured our imagination of Rumpius as this lone, solitary figure surrounded by specimens that he himself had uh, worked hard to you know, assemble together. Uh, scholars are today beginning to pay attention to uh, uh, a different way of thinking about uh, how knowledge was produced in the early modern period pointing instead to um, the drawing on the right where you find Rumpius, uh, where you find Rumpius, uh, you know, trying to project himself as someone who's out there doing uh, what we call field work, right? But notice that there is a dark-skinned figure on the bottom left who seems to be actually the one doing the work of collecting. Uh, sources like this offering, are offering new uh, perspective uh, that perhaps Rampius himself was very much reliant on local guides to help him make sense of what would have been to him in an entirely strange world. And many of these uh, local guides, uh, as a result, uh, were often written out or left out of uh, you know, the acknowledgement, uh, but in trying to recognize that they play an equally important role it's also changing us and pushing us to think about knowledge production through a much more collaborative lens. Uh, so um, let's have a look at this interesting watercolor, a very naive one showing uh, the king of uh, Siam, uh, Ayutthaya uh, uh, King Narai, watching this so a solar eclipse from the window of his palace. Of course, there's um, uh, the Jesuit uh, priest standing uh, next nearby, handing him an instrument, and then there are also ten other Jesuit priests, uh, perhaps seated in a circle uh, around a long telescope. Uh, you know, a seated European wearing a wig in the circle uh, is can be seen in the circle, uh, uh, and then there is a small figure close to the telescope in the foreground. Each of the two flanks of the circle decorated with six postures of courtiers apiece and their heads bowed to the ground and their hands joined in mere reverence. It's a very sort of strange uh, image, uh, uh, mixing signs with almost religious fervor. So in, 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 this, in a sense, I think the paradox and the idiosyncrasies that we see here really highlights that knowledge exchange is a two-way process. And very often we forget that uh, as much as um, uh, Europeans are keenly and, and eagerly uh, capturing and documenting what they see around them, there was also equally uh, corresponding curiosity on the, on the side of the Asian uh, interlocutors. So, for example, Ibn Muhammad Ibrahim notes that uh, uh, the, you know, the king Narai himself uh, sent for pictures depicting modes of living and the courts of foreign kings. He himself was uh, as much uh, curious about uh, Western painting. So really the exchange of images alongside other curiosities had become a standard feature of early modern diplomacy as well as an occasional focus on trade. Uh, you know, Mughal Emperor Jahangir, for example, we did receive paintings of English nobility presented to him by ambassadors uh, with enthusiasm, uh, while a depiction, for example, of a naked Venus brought to Japan uh, did cause quite a lot of controversy, perhaps arousing both interest and confusion uh, as to this new genre that is called the nude uh, that the Japanese were encountering to the picture of a naked Venus. Uh, and then there are also examples such as John Baptiste Tavernier, who reported uh, conversing with the Shah of Persia on the subjects of paintings of women. Uh, you know, uh, and therefore, what all these uh, tend to suggest is that if in, in port cities, uh, lively trade, knowledge exchange, 
is really part of a two-way process. And out of this uh, comes the birth of a new type of knowledge. And uh, rather than view this knowledge as something that is developed from within the uh, center of the European metropole, uh, the, the concept of hybrid knowledge is applied today uh, for it encapsulates the diverse information drawn together through ways of knowing that included openness, collaborative work, collecting and prospecting, classification and circulation. Uh, in turn, what we call knowledge, whether it's botanical, medical, cartographic, ethnographic or linguistic, was by nature not invented solely by the metropolitan elites. Rather, it emerged from the multicultural and multidirectional interaction and conflicts that took place and in and between all the different settlements of port cities uh, across uh, different parts of the world. And in fact, trying to locate the discussion of both scientific and commercial revolutions, we through this network understanding of empire uh, helps us to sort of see a much more nuanced uh, view that prioritizes what is non-European and also what is outside of Europe as equally important sites to acknowledge where knowledge was really produced. Uh, and what it does is that it also uh, widen uh, our recognition of the range of actors involved in the production of knowledge and uh, it also forces us to examine uh, what are the functioning of patronage of local uh, in relation to global scales okay uh, so part of this that we can understand through perhaps the dictionary of English and Malayo and Malayo English attributed to the trader Thomas Bowery so the publication of this work first, uh, really was announced as the first in dictionary in English and in an Asian language. But really it came, uh, it, was, it was building on a kind of momentum that was, uh, uh, was already happening on the ground. Uh, there was stiff competition between the English and the Dutch for the control of Southeast Asia spice trade. And this was fierce throughout the 17th century. So while Dutch supremacy was widely acknowledged in the region by 1630s, uh, the English merchants were not altogether absent and they continued to trade, uh, particularly for pepper on the Sumatra coast. And therefore, the need to fend for themselves prompted some to acquire more than a smattering of Malay. Uh, because Dutch scholarship had moved so much uh, swifter than uh, in the Malay world, uh, you know, uh, by, from 1599, uh, it had already compiled a Malay word list. Uh, and in 1603, already published a book on Dutch and Malay dialogues compiled by Frederick Hopeman. Uh, you know, uh, moreover, the four Gospels were already translated into Malay as early as 1612 and 1646. Uh, and Malay dictionaries were already published in The Hague in 1623 as well as in Batavia in 1677. Uh, these dictionaries, training manuals and scriptures were produced by alliances of VOC merchants and Dutch scholars deployed to bolster the Dutch East India Company's power by attracting local Dutch speaking allies and converts to post, uh, Protestant Christianity. So uh, the English East India Company, like its Dutch rival, was also aware of the need for the competency of language. However, unlike the Dutch, the, uh, uh, the East India Company, the British East India Company was slow in setting up printing presses in their settlements. And in fact, uh, they collaborated more with scholars back in England and, and, and one of the results was uh, the 18th century dictionary of Malayo and of English and Malayo and Malayo of English, which you see here. And uh, in this particular uh, dictionary, there's a really wonderful map uh, showing the countries wherein the Malayo language is spoken. And really, what it uh, depicts is uh, the, the 
archipelago or the island part of Southeast Asia, thereby testifying and is a strong evidence to how the Malay language was really uh, a language that uh, had widespread currency in this part of the world. Uh, important to note that while it was uh, Malay was often described as the Latin of uh, you know Southeast Asia, uh, it wasn't really the High Malay or the Court Malay that was widespread and widely used. It was the Bazaar Malay or the Pasar Malay, and therefore it is more accurate to say that what was widely used was in fact a trade language rather than a, an official. A Mandarin language such as Latin. So finally, let's have a look at this uh, wonderful map uh, that's been uh, that, uh, included in uh, a book uh, called The Description of the Kingdom of Tonkin. Uh, so it's a map showing Hanoi uh, and in fact uh, the map was uh, commissioned by someone called uh, Samuel Barron, uh, born Solomon Barron, uh, and he himself had an interesting life, though having a, a European name, he was in fact born in the capital of Tonkin, uh, in, then called Tang Long, and, uh, but today it's known as Hanoi. So trade of Southeast and East Asia at that time of Barron's birth centered on the exchange of high quality Chinese silk and Japanese silver. And Baron himself was the son of a Dutchman, Hendrik Baron, uh, who was already in 1651 described as a long-term resident of Tonkin. So he was familiar with the local culture and language. And of according to Dutch records as well, Hendrik Baron lived with his Vietnamese wife and therefore Salomon's mother uh, uh, herself is Vietnamese. So marriage alliances of uh, VOC agents like this in the early period yeah, of trade uh, with local uh, marriage alliances with local women were seen to be highly advantageous. So very different from how it has changed in the, by the late 19th century and early 20th century where such marriages were discouraged and frowned upon. In fact, in the early period, it was viewed with as something that was of great advantage, especially in a country like uh, Vietnam then, where trade was mainly controlled by women. So uh, uh, someone like Baron uh, had the advantage of uh, you know, being born in uh, a mixed family and therefore would be instructed in both uh, uh, the ways of uh, the local Vietnamese as well as you know, European trade by his parents. And Stephen Greenball, uh, who is a scholar, describes uh, these type of figures as cultural go-betweens and they manage encounters in the course of travel and colonial conquest. In fact, Greenblatt uh, considers them as the ultimate creator of the self. Uh, so cultural go-betweeners are uh, ultimate creators of the self. Uh, since they are also the ones who passes from one representational form into another, who mediates between systems and who inhabits the in-between spaces. So all these figures, uh, uh, those who have a hybrid or mixed background, tend to act as go-between us. Uh, they are go-between figures. They, bro they are brokers. Uh, and they move from one culture into another culture, uh, fulfilling numerous overlapping roles in language, diplomacy, law, navigation, map territory, mapping territory, explaining the manners and customs of foreign people, or in, even in collecting uh, local medicinal plants and ethnographic curiosities. Uh, someone like Baron, uh, Baron, for example, uh, would work uh, across different uh, institutions and would hold different allegiances. Ultimately, uh, at one point in his career, he would end up in Madras in 1685, where he would complete his description of the Kingdom of Tonkin, which is the book where you see this illustration here. It's part of a, a set of illustration, uh, and the work itself was dedicated to his patron and the British East India Company. 
Uh, but what's exciting about these illustrations is that uh, today the originals have been rediscovered. Uh, so you can be, uh, scholars are able to do com make comparisons between what was published and what was the original draft. Uh, as 17th century Hanoi was uh, a, a kind of center for art and the illustration, particularly those that depict the court, uh, are not dissimilar in style to contemporary religious paintings that were produced there. Uh, in, in this sense, uh, uh, it is very likely that Baron had also commissioned local painters uh, with, to help with the original draft. And in fact, he noted that he copied them from originals by a Tonkinier of eminent quality, suggesting that uh, uh, in many, uh, most of the illustrations which, uh, which he is attributable to his hand, uh, they were in fact drawing on local pictorial conventions. Uh, and this might mean either he recruited a local artist to produce the images uh, or compiled them himself from various originals, or he drew them based on uh, what he, uh, the pictorial conventions that he was familiar with. Uh, so um, what is so exciting about uh, a work like this, for example, is that, uh, you know, uh, Comparing this to the draft copy, we see uh, uh, in both instances uh, an attempt to incorporate also uh, Western styles. Uh, so in the draft illustration, uh, there was in fact a Western style compass that was attached to the map, but it also makes use of axonometric or parallel perspective as employed in Chinese and Japanese scroll painting. And thus, uh, in, in the use, in the convention of the scroll painting, there is no vanishing point, there's no linear perspective, there is no sense of recension into death, death that is the hallmark of uh, uh, European painting and how you model a character and, uh, and imbue it with a sense of uh, 3D perspective as in as if it exists within space but here it is a rather flat uh, uh, visualization of a landscape and principally as something that scrolls uh, across horizontally on the surface of the paper uh, this view is always uh, uh, what the the view that is of often employed uh, in the horizontal scroll painting is that of the bird's eye view. Uh, and as a result, the size of the figures and the architectural elements are often uh, similar in both the foreground and the background because they don't recede back into space. The background uh, doesn't become smaller as a result. It is this strange uh, mixing of style, uh, right? Uh, the ability to hold two different types of perspectives uh, at, at one at one go in, uh, in in creating a landscape portrait of what the port city of Hanoi would look like. So on the one hand, uh, playing to uh, having a Western style compass in a draft suggests that there is a desire to introduce some measure of uh, 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 European cartography into uh, how the port city is being depicted. Yet at the same time, the pictorial conventions draw heavily on uh, uh, something that is local, something that is familiar to a, uh, someone like uh, Samuel Barron, who actually grew up in Tonkin and would be very familiar with the arts and cultural scene of that particular city. Uh, but at the same time, uh, the illustrations themselves belong to a book and in the book itself, he was required to, uh, in many ways, display his acquaintance with contemporary and classical European culture in equal measure. Uh, so in writing about Tonkin, he wrote through a comparative lens, quoting Luther, for example, uh, and comparing the Tonkinese or the Vietnamese to the ancient Spartans. And to please his English reader, 
even dropped references on the Spanish Armada. So in this way, what we're seeing is a kind of um, discretion uh, and discrepancy as well uh, between the texts which tend to perform uh, a Europeanness versus a kind of pictorial convention that drew and references uh, the possibility of other sources uh, and bring that into play. And therefore, as we're studying the text in relation to uh, the illustration, what you have is a kind of interesting disjuncture. But this disjuncture is productive. So rather than irreconcilable, it is in fact symptomatic of what Grimblad had has called uh, uh, the figure of the cultural goal between as someone who passes from one representational form to another, uh, who mediates between systems, who inhabits the in-between spaces. And that hybrid knowledge is something that emerges from this space of in-between uh, is uh, important to remember as we think of the early modern period as a space where uh, knowledge is not yet foreclosed and that in the building of this knowledge uh, of the mm. world uh, it, one must necessarily look at the world rather than at uh, what was presumed to be the center of knowledge production that is located solely in Europe.